Yeah, good afternoon. Hello, uh, I'm Arne Kiesling from the RIPE NCC Registration Services Department. Um, after hearing the talk about the future of data centers, the good news is those data centers will need IP addresses in the future as well to function, um, making the RIPE NCC quite happy. Um, one thing that uh, we were asked to talk about here is um, assignment registrations, registry data quality, also a bit touching on the aspect of geolocation and how um, registering your assignment can help you. Um, so we'll basically try to find a definition of what is actually registry data quality, why is it important, how can it help you, look into what can happen if you register your assignments in the database in a way that makes it, uh, well, not to say easier, but uh, to place networks on a map. Uh, what you can also do to protect your resources, things like uh, updating your contact details uh, publicly in the database with the RIPE NCC, and also to give you a bit of input where does the RIPE NCC come in and help you because um, it's nice to hear about I need to update the database, register assignments, but what do you guys actually do to help us with this? And there's a few activities that we regularly do. Um, to look at registry data quality and why is it important. Uh, registry data is basically information about the resource holder who has been allocated a block of address space who has been assigned a certain AS number, plus contact details for that organization. Who do I contact in case there is any problems with the network? Uh, the quality of this data, at least the public part that is accessible to everyone via the right database, for example, gets a lot of focus from external parties nowadays. When you look at um, law enforcement agencies uh, trying to fight cybercrime, things like this. They use the RIPE database for an initial lookup to find out who's the holder of a prefix. Uh, also, the whole transfer policy where organizations are allowed to trade IP addresses between each other to find out who can I contact in order to uh, negotiate a transfer, buying address space from those people. Um, so this external focus on the publicly available data is there. When the RIPE NCC issues resources, if we, for example, allocate an IPv4 or an IPv6 block to one of our members, we, of course, register it in the database to make sure the whole world knows, okay, this block is allocated to um, certain company, nobody else is supposed to be using it. What also happens is that our systems write into a statistics file uh, that basically is updated every night with the new delegations, the delegated statistics that we publish on the FTP server. Everybody can use it to look up what has been issued yesterday, uh, information, not only the prefix and the company name that received the resource, also the country code of that organization is locked there. But um, registry data by itself or by definition is basically only who's holding a resource, how can I contact these people? No language, geolocation, routing, reverse DNS information. This is mainly operational stuff that is not part of the registry itself. That uh, is added by the user in the database over time, so this is something you need to maintain as well. Looking at the way the whole uh, addresses are distributed, um, we picked um, yeah, the way IPv6 resources are distributed. The V4 picture is a bit uh, sad because um, IANA uh, for IPv6, they hold a slash three. The Internet Architecture Board has reserved seven more slash threes for future use to be put in production whenever that block is um, yeah, used up. Um, so. IANA knows which slash three they received, and they allocate slash 12s to the regional internet registries. So, Erin, APNIC, 
RipeNCC, Lacnic, Afrinic, they all get blocks of slash 12s. Ayana knows exactly which slash 12 went where. The same with the regional internet registries. They follow the same approach. We at the RipeNCC, we know which company we allocated a slash 32 IPv6 to. You send in your request, you are basically the LRs are our members. We know <clears throat> this member received this slash 32. The same with um, PI assignments. There's the LRR in between as the middle man or the agent to submit the request on behalf of the end user, but in the end, when we approve a PI assignment request, we make sure we know the company that requests the prefix exists, and we lock the information of the company that received the PI assignment in the database and also in the delegated statistics. Where do our members come into play at this point? From your allocation, you further assign address space to your customers. A policy requirement is that as soon as you start using a network prefix in a deployment, you also need to register an object in the database to declare that it's in use. So <clears throat> basically, you would follow the same structure as um, yeah, the registries above. Whenever you, or an LRR, issues an assignment, the company that receives the assignment uh, wants to also make sure that they are registered as the holder of the block. You need to put this in the RIPE database as part of the policies. RIPE database itself is a database for internet resources. So basically, which address space or IAS number is assigned. And it also has a second functionality as a routing registry where you can basically say, for this prefix, I authorize AS123 to announce it on the internet. And mentioned before, the policies say, as soon as you start using address space, register an object in the database to declare the address space as being in use. Nobody else should be using it. And on top of that, to provide contact information. If you assign address space to a customer and something goes wrong with their network, you don't want to be contacted. The people who operate the network, so your customer, should be contacted and should learn about it so people can talk to them directly. So the assignment functionality or the assignment registration provides contact information as well. In preparation for this, we looked up two examples of assignments registered in the database by <clears throat> a member from Slovenia, actually. They happen to have an office uh, in Belgrade, and they also, of course, operate uh, in Slovenia. Uh, so on the left, you see part of the assignment as it would be registered in the right database. The right-hand side shows you um, geolocation information from RIPESTAT, um, basically a tool that the RIPENCC provides for people to query information about uh, internet resources. Part of RIPESTAT has geolocation information. We use a third-party provider for this because we don't run geolocation ourselves. Um, I'll get into um, why this yeah, information is not really 100% uh, accurate, so we know about uh, geolocation issues and how to put your network on a map in the proper location. Um, looking at the assignment that is used here in Belgrade, um, the LRR, first of all, put basically as many details as possible, street address, um, city, uh, country. They also used... Um, the country code, so the Slovenian LRR, the allocation has the Slovenian country code. The more specifics the assignments you actually register allows you to use different country codes, so you're not restricted to only use your addresses in Serbia. Uh, what the LRR also did is using an um, experimental attribute that can be used uh, in assignments, so-called geolocation. Um, not widely used. Um, 
the idea is to make uh, the life of geolocation providers a little bit easier to query the right database and if people use the geolocation attribute, you know best where your networks are located. What you would do, you use G GPS coordinates to put this um, on a map to point exactly where this network is or where, in this case, uh, I guess that's an office. And if somebody tries to look up uh, these coordinates, that network is actually within three minutes, within a three minute walk from here um, in Belgrade. And you, also, you immediately see the problem with the geolocation. It's not a three minute walk to this point here. We are over here. So <clears throat> the geolocation providers at least figured out this network is in somewhere in Serbia. Um, but that's about it. The reason for that is different geolocation providers use different methods to actually point out or to figure out where a network would or is located. Um, from the same allocation, the LR made another assignment to their office somewhere in Slovenia, and that's actually also accurate, at least um, country-wise, so geolocation points it to be in um, Slovenia. So both the assignments are actually from the same block. Making more specifics within your IPv4 allocation allows you to at least have um, the network located in the correct country. Uh, this LR basically used um, extensive information about the office addresses and the country code. You have uh, possibilities to use the geolocation attribute this is not widely used at the moment. Uh, it's designed for geolocation providers to be picked up. But also an attribute language exists that becomes interesting in countries that have mul or that are multilingual. If you think of Belgium or Switzerland, if uh, somebody in, from the Italian part in Switzerland goes to Google and he gets it in um, German, they won't be happy. So you can use also a language attribute in the right database to point out my customers in this network speak a certain language. Most important part to take away from this is actually register your assignments in the database. When you send in requests for an assignment, uh, for a PI assignment, for example, make sure the information is as accurate as possible. So at least the country of the customer is correct. And um, one more thing, it's basically it's a policy requirement. You start using space, register it in um, the database. This is <clears throat> um, an experimental service. Um, the, our research and development people are working on. IXP Country Jedi, basically we looked at um, routes from Serbia doing different measurements using the RIPE Atlas infrastructure to find out, okay, where does traffic from Serbia actually go? Um, geolocation providers use different uh, information as well for pointing or for figuring out where a network is located. They look at the delegated statistics. They look at um, the country code registered in the RIPE database, for example. But they also do their own measurements, like trace route measurements from vantage points to, from several points to a certain network. And then based on the latency, they can figure out whereabouts this network is located. What I'm trying to get here to is putting the assignments in the database is one thing. Another thing is try to keep your traffic local. Uh, that will decrease latency. It will basically also um, yeah, make sure the traffic doesn't leave uh, the country borders uh, further than necessary. And by keeping latency uh, at the limit, it makes it easier for geolocation to be correct. What else can you do to uh, um, yeah, take care of your resources? You've received a block from the RIPE NCC. Um, you need to maintain registration information. And there's, for at least our members, there's two different levels of contact. 
first of all, the public information that you have in the database. So your administrative contact, your technical contact persons for the network, um, the DNS department, uh, abuse contacts. This information is your responsibility. You can refer to the people that are responsible in your company um, for these services. So if there are any issues, people will try to contact the admin C or tech C, so and C, and so on to um, find out what's going on. Members, LRs, also share other contact details with the RIPE NCC, contact persons, somebody who is actually authorized to represent the LR in front of the RIPE NCC to send in requests. We will basically happily share um, confidential information that is only supposed to be between the LR and the RIPE NCC with anybody who is listed as a registered contact. Um, we accept resource requests. The RIPE community a few years ago uh, accepted the policy to transfer resources. IPv4, IPv6, AS numbers can be transferred from one organization to another nowadays. Um, outdated contact information can cause issues in that respect. Um, so take care of your contact details in the RIPE database, and if you're an LRR, also make sure your contacts uh, that you share with the RIPE NCC are up to date. Because um, it can happen that uh, if it's not maintained, um, we will accept a request that is sent in from a registered contact. We don't know who left your company. So it has happened in the past that uh, people uh, submitted requests to transfer resources away while they were not even allowed to represent the company anymore. So because of outdated contact information, such requests uh, were almost approved. What we do on top of this is we don't blindly trust that um, your contact information is up to date. We fully understand that you have a normal day job as well and not just updating the right database and your contact details with the NCC. Um, yeah. Frequently, we do further checks, so-called due diligence. We basically have a look at um, who is sending in the request, who is signing the transfer agreement. And we even go a step further because the process requires also to send in recent company registration documents for the people involved in the transfer or for the, for the companies. We basically nowadays require that someone who has um, authority to sign official documents on behalf of the parties involved in the transfer has signed the agreement. If not, we cannot accept it. It's uh, uh, becoming uh, more and more strict just to make sure we do not process a transfer that is not correct or not authorized by the owner of the company or by the people who are responsible for this. As you can see, this is nowadays daily business in our department in registration services. We do about, we complete about 10 transfers, IPv4 only, a day. So that means evaluating the documentation, checking the database objects. It is um, but the RIPE community has decided there's no more minimum allocation size for IPv4. So people end or split up their IPv4 allocations. They transfer a slash 24 out of a slash 16 to somebody. To register this in the database, the object needs to be split. So it's um, a lot of effort that goes into this. And um, yeah, you see, um, for example, peaks. Towards the end of the year, this is when people decide to sell off the address space they hold and close the membership. Um, but on average, it's about 180 IPv4 transfers per month, IPv6 and AS numbers not included. For IPv4, uh, the policy restricts uh, transfers for 24 months. So after you received an allocation, it needs to stay with your LRR for 24 months. 
if you transfer something to your company, same thing applies. An allocation and also a PI assignment cannot be transferred again uh, within the next two years. Uh, it's a policy restriction that's in there just to avoid speculation. Uh, these restrictions do not exist for IPv6 or AS numbers at the moment. Uh, the, the concept is there's so much v6 space AS numbers that this is not becoming an issue. 16-bit um, AS numbers are a bit of a different topic. This might change in the future. So those are basically running out. Um, in regards to geolocation, again, when you look at transferring IPv4 resources to your LRR to further grow your network services whatsoever, um, you might run into geolocation problems again. The previous holder will have used the resource. Geolocation providers keep databases. They might not update them as frequently as uh, information in the right database gets updated and so on. So be aware of when you do transfers, geolocation might become an issue again, no matter how many assignments you already registered before this, before this becomes um, visible uh, in geolocation. Advice is again buy locally, so from someone in the area if you are interested in IPv4 transfers. Uh, the better option would be spend the money wisely and work on your IPv6 deployment. There's uh, a lot of work to do in that area, so um, choose one. The IPv6 deployment you will have to do at some point in the near future anyway. So. Transferring will only delay the pain or um, the investment in IPv6 for a short period of time. The final point is for the registry data quality, are you alone responsible for this? Are you basically um, yeah, left somewhere in the middle, hanging in midair that um, um, you need to figure out how to do things? The answer is no. RIPE-NCC does regular checks with its members, so-called mini-audits, or you can consider them mini-audits. What we do is we look at um, your registry information, company name, your postal address, contact persons, uh, phone numbers, stuff like this. So that's <clears throat> usually changed over time because data like this is not well maintained. We figured this out. Uh, during the assisted registry checks. Um, resource consistency, same thing. Assignment registrations in the database uh, for IPv4, IPv6. Also, uh, your end users with independent resources. Um, so we check a lot of details. You, our members usually don't have time to do on their own or they postpone them. So what happens is we randomly select LRRs for an assisted registry check. Um, this year we opened until now about 2,500 of those checks, which sounds quite a lot. Looking at the membership base of almost 15,000 means it will take five to six years before we contact an LRR again for this check. So the assisted registry check is actually a really good opportunity to do a review of this data if you don't want to do it on your own. 95% um, of the assisted registry check have resulted in updates the LRR had to do. It was mainly updating contact persons and registering assignments in the database. So um, it has definitely uh, advantages for an LRR as well. The goal mainly is update the registry, make sure your database records are fine, contact persons are updated, uh, inconsistencies with your data and how to fix them are part of this check, so we will help you with it. Um, we support you with, our with your registration tasks and we want to also stay in touch with you. In the past, as long as IPv4 was available, we were frequently in contact receiving your requests now that V4 has more or less run out. Um, 
members do not submit uh, their requests as frequent anymore as in the past. Um, what you can do, you can either wait until we randomly call you up for an assisted registry check. What you can also do, you can request one if you say this is something we would like to do. You can contact us and ask for it. Um, most of the times um, that works fine. And if you need help at any point, just don't hesitate to contact us at all. We don't know if you need any support. Um, don't wait till we come around for the next RS knock, for training courses, something like this. We are a membership organization. You pay your membership fees. You need to tell us what kind of support you need, and we'll be there for you. So if you have any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, uh, some of you, I guess, will see over the next three days in the trainings or uh, later on today during the breaks. Okay, you might be there. Uh, hi. Can yep. you tell us more about uh, geolocation? What provider are you using? And uh, well, the provider we use is uh, MaxMind, that uh, basically for RipeStat, because it's a service that is available. We don't run a geolocation service ourselves, so we have to rely on a third-party data for the information on RipeStat. So it's. Um, yeah, nothing we, we offer or we can do at the moment. It's, um, we rely on an external party for that. So to, uh, we, we are free to address the problems, some wrong information directed to them, right? I didn't, I didn't if we have it. some, some uh, wrong information, for, for example, yeah. can we contact them directly? Or? Yeah, you should talk to the providers that offer this uh, service to inform them about any changes or about incorrect data. We have no idea how flexible they are. Um, what, we try to or what, yeah, what we try to highlight is uh, the steps you should take in the right database, registering your assignments, using the attributes that are available there. If for some reason, like the examples we showed, we can obviously see the, at least the country is correct, but not the exact location. This is something where the third party providers come into play and how they get to their results, it's a yeah, mystery and they don't tell everyone what, how they measure it or how they get to this point. So this is something they need to figure out um, themselves and the more people inform them about it, the more likely it is that this will actually yeah, get acted on. Okay, thank you. I have one question. Uh, do you have uh, any idea on uh, who else is using the, the geolocation data? Because uh, um, I know that uh, there are a number of uh, web services uh, which are uh, uh, which are providing broad geolocation uh, for uh, internet users from Serbia, for browsing the web. Mm -hmm. So are the geolocation services actually using the geolocation data of IP resources from RIPE, or they have some uh, way of their own? Because if this is true, then there is some wider importance on having the correct data entered into the RIPE database. Yeah. Okay, now that's basically one thing is putting this stuff in the database. It's, from what we know, a combination of several sources. They look at the database, maybe the delegated stats files. They can use the geolocation attribute, trace routes, and their own measurements, and uh, basically looking at, um, or trying to gather as much information as possible, put it in a database, and then figure out where is this network located. So it's not exclusively the RIPE database. It can help to at least figure out the correct country. Um, but uh, there's other results that also come into play there. Yeah? Right. OK. Uh, thank you.